Hello, hi, I'm back. So I hope that everybody had a really wonderful Christmas and of course by now, Happy New Year. And I hope that for Christmas, you got everything you wanted either under the tree or from a very sweet person. Either way, I hope you got what you wanted. And for next year, I hope that it will be the best ever. Of course, it's already next year. Oh, well, I'm old. What do you want? <laughs> so the story I'm going to tell you today is called Making Tobacco. By the time that we were living in our little house and my dad was back and my grandma was there, um, I was going to school. But when I would come home, of course, there was nobody there. So I was what they considered a Schlüsselkind. A lot of us children were like that. We had a little rope around our neck with the house key. So of course, you know, we would come home and there was nobody there. I did have my dog, but I didn't have my job in the nursery yet. And cleaning our little cottage took almost no time because I did it every day. So it was never really dirty. And this particular day, um, there was a little girl in my class that, oh, I really liked her. I thought she was just gorgeous. She had these huge blue eyes and she had beautiful long blonde hair and her mother would always braid them. And once in a while, and my mother used to do this too, she would put the braids and put them on her head, make it like a little crown. And I really liked her and I used to hope that maybe one day I'd have the nerve to actually talk to her. I really wanted to be friends with her. Well, she had not been in the classroom for several days and we were all wondering what was going on. So that particular day, our teacher said, we have a very special visitor today and I want you to all listen to what this lady has to say. Well, it was a young woman. I did not think that she could have been old enough to be the mother of the little girl that was missing. But it turned out that she was, she introduced herself and she said, I want to talk to you about something and I will probably not be able to do this without breaking down and crying. But I want to emphasize that you all need to realize that it's very, very dangerous to go into the many ru ruins. Most of Bremen had been destroyed and there were ruins all over the place and they all had big signs that said to not go in. A lot of them had like these crossbones, but you know, well, there were still bombs in there somewhere. So she said that her little girl and her son had decided that they would go and investigate in one of these ruins, a ruin that had a big sign, you know, do not enter, do not come in here. And this is when she sort of choked up and she almost passed out. The teacher ran over and grabbed her. And then she said, no, no, I'm okay. Uh, I can do this. I need to do this. But I want you to know that my children went into one of those ruins and they are dead. They got blown up. And seconds later, I could hear somebody on the back of the class. So it was a very large classroom. We had 54 students. And I could hear a little girl in the back just crying. And um, the mother said, I really, really want you to pay attention to this. Never, ever go into any of these ruins. So when I left the classroom, I was very sad and I really didn't want to go home. So I decided to walk down on the cobblestone across the bridge to what is the center of what was the center of Bremen because there were always Americans. You could pick them out. They had these very shiny black shoes and then white socks and their pants were always really wide and they always had these long like trench coats on. And then if they didn't wear a hat, they had bristly haircuts. They were like, there was like no hair and then they looked like little, almost like a scrub brush on their head. And they all smoked. They all had uh, the same brand that you know, you could see them smoke. And I thought, okay, um, I'm just going to go over to that restaurant that's in the cellar by the city hall because the Americans all, every time I was there, one of them would come out and then they'd light up their lucky strike and, you know, walk along. So as soon as I got there, yeah, sure enough, I thought, oh, I'm lucky, there's one. 
and I followed him and he was going down the Bahnhofstrasse, which goes to um, a part of town that had very large mansions next to the park hotel and the city park. And they had used those mansions for a lot of the Americans. So I knew where he was going. You know, he was going by the Bahnhof and then he goes through the tunnel and, you know, I was right behind him and boy, yeah, I had my first cigarette. And I stayed back. I thought, you know, I don't want to get too close. And then he lit another cigarette. And by the time I picked that one up, when I started to get up, there was this huge man standing in front of me and I thought, oh my God, he saw what I did. And he looked at me and smiled and he opened my hand and he was this warm cigarette butt still. And, you know, I looked up at him and I said, oh God, I hope he's not going to get mad at me. But it was obvious he wasn't mad. He was smiling and I could sort of see tears in his eyes. And I thought, I wonder why he's so sad. And then I thought, well, maybe he has a little girl and he misses her. I mean, I don't know. He proceeded to look through all his pockets, his big overcoat, the coat that he had on under it, his pants, and he ended up giving me two packets of Lucky Strike that was like half full, which of course I didn't know until I got home, and then one that hadn't even been opened, and there was a little piece of chocolate that he gave to me, and it was like a little piece of chewing gum, and I thought, wow, this is really fun. Not only do I have cigarettes, so I could not, well, not cigarettes, tobacco. So I couldn't wait to run home. And as soon as I got home, I sat down at our dining room table and I took all these cigarettes and my mom had these little cuticle scissors and I opened them up and I made a pile of tobacco here and I put a little pile of little pieces of white paper. I knew how to make cigarettes. My dad would take tobacco and he had this little packet that he took out this piece of white paper and then he would put the tobacco on it. And then he would take his tongue and go like this and then he'd close it up and then he would twist it like this. So it was twisted on both ends was this fat thing in the middle. So when I was opening those packets, I thought, wow, I guess these people don't know how to make a cigarette. I had never seen one that came out of a packet. I only knew what my dad did. So I couldn't wait for him to come home and oh my God. Then he came, but he had one of his friends with him. And I said, Papa, Papa, look, look, I made you tobacco. And there's this big pile. And he went, oh, you're the best little girl. This is wonderful. Oh, thank you so much. And as usual thing, he would pick me up and he'd spin around in a circle and he'd say, oh, I love you. I love you. He was kissing me. And this guy that's with him looked at him and he said, what is wrong with you? And my dad said, what do you mean what's wrong with me? How can you thank her? If my kid did something that stupid, I would beat the holy crap out of her. And my father just went, really? Are you kidding? She has never seen cigarettes before. She knows how to make a cigarette. Don't you, my cute little one, you know how to make a cigarette. Tell Papa, how do you do that? And I said, you take a little piece of white paper, you put the tobacco in the middle, and then you go like this, and then you close it up, and then you go like that. And he said, see, that's how you make a cigarette. So she made me tobacco. And his friend just looked at him and he said, you know, there is something really wrong with you. This is nuts. You don't get it. There's something wrong with your kid. And my father said, stop it. There's nothing wrong with her. She made me tobacco. Don't you get it? She's never seen a cigarette before. She didn't know that. Then his friend said, well, I don't know. You know, you're hopeless. That's just like your attitude. There's something really wrong because, you know, you did the same thing when she made you the pictures. And my dad laughed and he said, that was so great. And he hugged me and he said, you know what, Papa really liked it when you gave me all those beautiful pictures. That just shows how much you love me. And his friend was just standing there shaking his head. And he said, 
that is nuts. That, that I don't even understand this. What had happened uh, one day when I was by myself, I was snooping around, I was cleaning, and then there was a drawer, and I thought, gee, I wonder what's in the drawer. It was in my parents' bedroom. And I opened it up, and wow, I was so excited. There were these big pieces of paper, and there was a whole stack of them. And it would say, like, a one, and then I wasn't sure what the rest was, and then another one said a two, and three, but they were huge and they had beautiful pictures on them. And I thought, I'm gonna make Pava some pictures. So I went and I got the little cuticle scissors and I was very careful and cutting out all the little pictures. So I had a pile of beautiful pictures and then the other part that I didn't like that had all these numbers and this word on it, like a million or something. So when my dad came home, he laughed so hard. I've never seen him laugh that hard. My grandmother, when she came in, she said, Oh, mon dieu, mon dieu. And my dad said, why, what's wrong? There are all the pieces are here. I'll just go to the bank and I'll tell them that my little girl made me pictures. She doesn't know it's money. I mean, how would she know that? She doesn't know that she made me pictures. So yeah, so he took everything and he went to the bank and later he would tell that story and everybody would laugh. He said that everybody at the bank just cracked up that his little girl made him beautiful pictures out of money because what did I know? So anyway, he said to his friend, you know what? I think maybe I understand why your children don't really like you. You know they're afraid of you, don't you? And they will never tell you the truth because you don't really have a good relationship with them. You know, don't tell me that I'm doing everything wrong with Aranka. I'm not. Because she loves me and she gave me tobacco and she made me pictures. So there. And that's it. And I no longer want to talk about it. And I think that maybe, you know, you should sort of leave now because I need to celebrate with my little girl because she made me a big pile of tobacco. That's my story for today. I love you all. Bye.